um, soon. I will drop a link in the chat for where you can purchase the book, Men Who Hate Women, From Incels to Pickup Artists, The Truth About Extreme Misogyny and How It Affects Us All, straight from PNP's website. You can ask our speakers a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to many of those questions as we can toward the end of the program. But we apologize in advance if we don't have the time to address your question. Also, there are live transcripts that you can um, turn on. And that button is at the bottom of your screen as well. Let me introduce tonight's guest. Laura Bates is the founder of, Every, of the Everyday Sexism Project and writes regularly for the New York Times, Guardian, Telegraph, and many others. She is a regular contributor to the T Today program, Women's Hour, Channel 4 News, News Night, and more, and has been awarded a British Empire Medal in the Queen's Honors List for services to gender equality. Bates will be in conversation with Soraya Sh Shamali, an award-winning author and activist. She writes and speaks frequently on topics related to gender norms, inclusivity, social justice, free speech, sexualized violence, and technology. The former executive director of the Representation Project and the director and co-founder of the Women's Media Center Speech Project. She has long been committed to expanding women's civic and political participation. So let's give our guests a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Thanks so much, Morgan. Um, Laura, uh, it's really delightful to be in conversation with you again tonight. Um, thank you. I know it's really late where you are, um, um, but always, always so good to see you and to talk. Um, I thought it might help the audience to um, ask you to just give a quick sort of background on how you came to write this book. Um, mm -hmm. You and I have worked together for a very long time and um, I know this, but I think it would really be great context for people to understand. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much to Politics and Prose for having us. And thank you so much, Sarah. It's always so great to talk to you as well. I really appreciate it. Um, I, uh, my background is that I uh, run a feminist campaign, a project called the Everyday Sexism Project, which is a um, started life as a very simple website where people of any gender anywhere in the world could share any experience of gender inequality from sexual harassment to workplace discrimination to sexual abuse, with the aim of showing the um, significant number of these problems, with the aim of revealing how severe the problem is in a world where people often say that sexism doesn't exist anymore, um, but also of, of recognizing the spectrum of how those different incidents connect. And as part of that work, I spend a lot of time um, in schools with young people. And as part of that work, I think as any feminist activist or really woman with an opinion will know, um, you become aware of extreme groups, that there is extreme misogynistic hatred um, percolating amongst certain online communities. And you become aware, I think as well, of how organized those communities can be. But despite the fact that from very early on, I was aware of these groups because they were getting in touch because I was receiving perhaps on a bad day, 200 rape and death threats. There was a general philosophy, a general kind of agreement, if you like, that we just didn't give them the oxygen of publicity. And, and I think that that was at the time broadly sensible when I started doing this work about a decade ago. But I've been going into schools a lot of schools, two schools a week on average for about the last 10 years. And in the last perhaps two years, I noticed a very distinct shift in the responses from boys. So I talked to young people from aged about eight to 18 about things like sexual consent, healthy relationships, sexism, gender stereotypes, media. And those conversations, of course, are varied and often difficult. And you know, there's resistance and they can be awkward. But in the last couple of years, there has been a kind of very steely determined resistance from boys that I hadn't encountered before. And it was a real intolerance, a real aversion to even having a conversation. And these boys were coming pre-primed to tell me that I was a man-hating feminazi, that the gender pay gap is a myth, that there is a vast feminist conspiracy at the heart of our government, that the media is in on it as well, that white men are the real victims of today's society. And slowly they started dropping out the same direct 
quotes and the same fake statistics that men are 80% of the victims of domestic violence, that 93% of rape allegations are false, that thousands of men have lost their jobs because of the Me Too movement, which is a witch hunt run mad. And suddenly at that point, it clicked. I realized these boys weren't coming up with this stuff on their own. It wasn't a coincidence that they were coming out with the same completely fake figures. And I started talking to them and asking, how do you know? Where did you learn this stuff? And suddenly I realized that these online groups of men who hate women, the ones who've been sending me death threats for years, the ones that we didn't talk about, were running an incredibly impressive, well-oiled grooming machine, essentially, that they were capitalizing on and gaming algorithms, social media platforms to radicalize young men, specifically into anti-feminism and hatred of women. And that the results were so widespread that I was encountering these philosophies in every school I went into. And at that point, suddenly it became terrifying that we don't talk about these groups, because suddenly I realized we are talking about groups with access, huge and increasing access to young people around the world. We are also talking about groups who are explicitly coming offline and acting in the name of this particular form of hatred, carrying out acts of terrorism, although we don't describe them as that, and that you have this this terror philosophy, if you like, this extremist network acting with almost complete impunity because of the fact that nobody knows it exists. Right. And that was what made me want to write the book because I felt at this point, the argument not to give them the oxygen of publicity is outweighed by the imperative to be able to stop them. And the only way to do that is if people become aware of their existence. Right. I think, you know, I think it's important to early on <clears throat> to stress that what you're describing is global um, and that it's networked globally yeah. uh, and that boys are exposed to it at younger and younger ages, um, including through gaming. Mm -hmm. um, gaming that a lot of, I think, adults and parents think of as the electronic equivalent of toys. Um, and it's really not that at all. Um, and so, you know, I, I, want to ask you now if you can sort of describe the constellation of networked communities, um, because there is a Venn diagram of these communities. And um, I think it would be helpful for you to sort of go through that list and just identify for people what they are and what they what, what defines each one. Sure. So yes, absolutely. And um, we are talking, I think it's important to say here, not about kind of common or garden online sexism and general sort of low level misogyny. This is not about saying, I don't like it when people make sexist jokes on the internet, that offends me. We are talking about very specific communities um, with their own rules, their own language, their own lexicon. Um, we are talking about very significantly sized communities. And just as you say, they are separate and distinct with their own belief systems. They're sometimes at war with each other, but of course they also have crossover. They all really take as their starting point the idea of what they describe as taking the red pill. So this is a, a concept borrowed from the matrix, the idea that if you take the red pill, you suddenly become aware of the world around you being completely different from what you had originally thought. Um, loosely, the term manosphere has been used to kind of describe the overarching number of these groups, the sort of world that they inhabit. But you have a spectrum of them and they behave in different ways and have different beliefs. So perhaps at the most extreme end of the spectrum are incels, who some people may have heard of or, or perhaps not. These are um, men who see themselves as involuntarily celibate. In other words, they want to be having sex and they're not. And they have an entire pseudoscientific belief system about the fact that women are denying them sex, that women should be punished, that women should be stripped of all sexual agency and essentially should either be murdered en masse to punish them for the way that they treat men or should be forced into sexual slavery, preferably state mandated. So these are men who actively um, incite hatred and violence against women. They discuss at length the best ways to rape women, to get away with raping women, the best weapons to use to massacre women with. And this is the group in particular where men explicitly in the name of this group and having been radicalized by this group have repeatedly gone offline and done just that. They have massacred women across the United States. Men like George Sedini, who walked into a Tallahassee yoga studio and murdered nine women. Men like Elliot Roger in Santa Barbara, 
who massacred women starting outside a sorority house because he felt he'd been rejected by them. Men in Canada, for example, like Alex Manassian, Alec Manassian who drove a speeding rental van to a crowd of pedestrians. Um, men like Ben Moynihan in the UK who attempted to murder three women during a, a, a stabbing spree. Um, men like more recently the teenager in um, Toronto who walked into a massage parlor and killed a woman with a machete. So that is perhaps the most extreme group. And then the next group I think along is men going their own way. This is a group of men who believe that women are so toxic and dangerous that the best possible option instead of retaliating and trying to murder them is to utterly avoid them and cut them out of your life altogether um, to a really quite extreme point. You don't talk to a woman, you don't have a relationship with a woman. And this seems kind of ridiculous. And I think it would be very easy to think we must be talking about a tiny handful of, of, of kind of weirdos. But the reality is that you have a huge intense network of hundreds of thousands of members you've got forums blogs video youtube video uh, creators you've got communities social media platforms and so on then you have men's rights activists these are um, again men who really buy into anti-feminist rhetoric so men's rights activists really um, play into this idea that men are the real victims of today's society that there is a vast feminist conspiracy um, an over overblown woke mob infiltrating our media claiming that women are victims of sexism when in reality they are the all-powerful and men are the real victims and they focus their attention more on kind of a media and a a legal route. They try to undermine and defund, for example, women's frontline sexual violence services. They bring spurious lawsuits trying to um, advocate against women getting custody in divorce cases, that kind of thing. So they have the kind of veneer of respectability, if you like, in the public eye. They're the kind of acceptable public face of the manosphere. Then you have pickup artists who are again quite a related group because they operate based on this idea of women as solely um, dehumanized, hypersexualized objects with the pure sole purpose of male sexual gratification. But rather than believing as incels do that things are hopeless and they should massacre women, they believe and promote the idea that there is a kind of magical technique that you can learn to force any woman to have sex with you. And in the public eye, we tend to think of these men as kind of lovable rogues, men like Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother or Joey from Friends. But the reality is that this is a hundred million dollar global industry where men in pretty much any major city around the world on any given weekend pre-COVID could spend thousands of dollars to go to a boot camp, camp where they would be trained essentially in the art of sexually harassing and sexually assaulting and raping in many cases women. Um, so you're looking at these kind of groups which have very different ways of I suppose moving out from that beginning point but the beginning point the utter dehumanization and objectification of women is the same. So um, you know I want to I want to link what you're talking to to this the word terrorism you and I have written often about the way terrorism uh, is used to actually deny the kind of violence against women that we're talking about that is systemic and that is deeply political at its heart. Um, and in the, the UK in particular, I'm thinking about the assassination of Joe Cox and um, the man who stabbed her and killed her, Thomas Mayer, was later found to have uh, links to white supremacist movements in the United States. I think that it's always kind of a mistake to say a white supremacist movement without mentioning that it's almost inevitably also simultaneously a white male supremacist mo movement. Um, those are completely, um, you, you cannot tease those two things apart ultimately in the ideology. Um, and the links between that kind of global movement of white male supremacy um, and men like Anders Breivik, who, you know, killed dozens, over 70 young people uh, in a spasm of white Christian ethno-nationalism. And what was so striking to me about what he did was that in the coverage, particularly in the United States, even though he'd written the manifesto that was explicitly overtly anti-feminist right from the beginning, nobody reported on that aspect of it. Um, so can you talk about the way these ideas migrate? Um, and in fact, the way they migrate from normalized benevolent sexism 
into the sort of dismissal of concerns and gaslighting and then explosions of violence like this? Yeah, so we see huge connections between the kind of uh, societal minimization, dismissal, belittling of normalized day to day sexism and the ease of radicalization, I think is fair to say. So, you know, if you are a teenage boy and online groups are feeding you this bile, this misogynistic anti feminist rhetoric, it is much easier for you to see that as um, a valid argument, as as you know, just a just a fair debate, you know, just a, someone's opinion. If in the mainstream media you are seeing those ideas being excused and platformed, so in our biggest um, national radio program, for example, they talked about Me Too as a witch hunt. Um, you have sanitized somewhat respectable political and academic figures using this rhetoric. You have, of course, Donald Trump throwing out dog whistle rhetoric that expands what these groups refer to as the Overton window. They're obsessed with this idea of a, of a sphere, if you like, a kind of bracket of what is considered um, publicly acceptable discourse, societally tolerable discourse. And the more that traditional media and societal norms push that towards um, anti-feminist and, and right-wing and, and racist terminology, the more these online groups are able to get their claws into young people. So that spectrum is very important, but also it's just very important, I think, what you've said about the overlap between these groups and white supremacy, because that Venn diagram is almost a circle. And as you say, it is just missed repeatedly. I mean, Anders Breivik is the perfect example of this. The first three sentences of his manifesto were, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates. Yeah. Um, it was it was birth rates that protesters, as they called themselves, were chanting about when they had in Charlottesville the first, you know, for many years, openly neo-Nazi, openly white supremacist rally. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't see coverage that recognizes that white supremacy is based on extremely misogynistic foundations, based on this idea of white women as a kind of dehumanized commodity, if you like, being plundered by other men. It's based on extraordinarily racist ideas of forcing white women to sexual slavery, a forced sterilization of women of color. And at the same time, within these extreme male supremacist or misogynistic movements, there is enormous racism, which again, doesn't get reported on when you right. look at that. So, you know, for example, men are not just furious, incels are not just furious that women aren't sleeping with them, they are furious that women are sleeping with black men in particular. And this is something that Elliot Roger, the most well-known incel murderer, explicitly spoke about time and again. His manifesto was full of extreme racism, but coverage of him doesn't mention that either. So you get this incredibly frustrating, utter failure and breakdown, I think, of both media and law enforcement, which just doesn't recognize that you cannot separate these two problems. And you saw it in the in the horrendous shootings recently in Atlanta, for example, where there was some kind of limited coverage that managed to recognize that we were talking about Asian American hate crime. Um, very little that even at all focused on the fact that the majority of those who'd been murdered were women, but almost no one at all who was able to put those two things together and recognize that we were talking about a very specific kind of racialized misogyny and that those two things are part of the same problem. Yeah. And it's only very recently, I think, that we are even beginning to really recognize white supremacy and, and the far right as forms of terrorism. So we have such a long way to go there. Um, but specifically when you come to this misogynistic male supremacy, it almost never at all is connected with the term terrorism. There has been one incident ever globally where somebody has been charged with terror related offenses. So yeah. you have someone like Alec Manassian who very deliberately murdered uh, 10 people, injured another 16, I think, and explicitly as soon as he was arrested said to police I did it because I'm an incel I hate women I was following in the tradition of Elliot Roger I wanted to murder women for not not sleeping with me 80% of his victims were women and yet terrorism just wasn't something that they applied and not even terrorism it's also the idea that there could be misogynistic hate crimes um yeah you know I think after a lot of these I know that even as a journalist, after several of these cases, I've called the police districts and asked explicitly whether charges would be brought on the basis of hate. And the, the 
the people tasked with answering these questions are dumbfounded by that question. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't matter. And I think, you know, I'm looking at the chat. Someone just said he killed two women. Elliot Roger killed two women and five men, including himself. And I, I know that you also have comments. I think it's really important here to say that hate crimes um, don't just kill the people that are targeted, right? Like this is the whole point about that FBI has a, a kind of 14 list point list for what constitutes a hate crime. And one of them is that there are targets of opportunity and there are people associated with the targets of the hate crime. So can you talk about how hate plays into this um, in terms of uh, criminality um, and, and, the, and the law, which of course is problematic because of bias in the law um, and incarceration. Um, but I think it's important to talk about recognizing racialized misogynistic hate. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of um, Elliot Roger, um, it's a really common thing for people to point out that some of his victims were men. Um, Elliot Roger killed his housemates because he yeah. would have been unable to carry out his crime if he hadn't silenced them first. Um, but it, it's such a common, I think, misconception. If you look very clearly at Elliot Roger's manifesto and at what he wrote about and what others wrote about, we are talking about somebody, and you can see this throughout the kind of incel community, who is furious with women for not having sex with them, but also who wants to murder men who are having sex with those women. So we are talking very specifically about an extreme misogynistic commodification of women as a sexual resource, and, and therefore somebody who sometimes murders men because they're having sex with those women. The, the fact that those victims are part of the picture doesn't in any way change the motivation and the misogyny behind that motivation. But I think that the police response is just hugely, hugely revealing because it shows that we don't take this stuff seriously. In the UK recently, we talked about making misogyny a hate crime because it is yeah. one of very few protected characteristics that, that isn't considered a hate crime. And there was enormous pushback from police commissioners, from police forces. Um, they talked about how ordinary people would much prefer that they were focusing on serious crimes. Um, our newspapers completely factually inaccurately um, on the front pages said, um, campaigners want to turn wolf whistling into a hate crime. Um, men will be jailed for complimenting a woman. Um, and actually recording something as a hate crime doesn't change the law or what is actually considered a crime. It just changes the way in which police record incidents and look at them. There is absolutely no appetite to do that or to take any of this seriously. I think a lot of this comes back to the fact that in the US, three women a day are murdered by an intimate partner in the UK, one woman every three days is murdered by a current or former partner around the world globally. Um, one in three women in her lifetime will be raped or beaten. We see violence against women as part of the wallpaper of our daily lives. We are used to it. It is an epidemic and it is at the same time completely and utterly normal. We are so used to seeing it that we just don't recognize it as extreme or out of the ordinary. And I think perhaps for that reason, our criminal justice system, our police, our society find it incredibly difficult to see these men as, as extreme or as terrorists. So um, I, I know you get this question all the time and I'm sure we'll get some, but I, I thought I would ask it now anyway, because you are talking to students all the time. Um, there, there's sort of, as I think you've described, this slide from a certain defensiveness, particularly among boys, particularly among white boys who are, you know, they're, they're immersed in the time that we're living in where white supremacy and male supremacy are topics of conversation. Um, but the shift that you describe into the denial and the sort of entrenched resistance and then actual misogynistic hate how do you talk to students when this is happening? Because in my experience, um, frankly, a lot of the girls in the room are silent because they know that they will pay, they'll, they'll have consequences for speaking up. Um, and yet you don't wanna leave this unaddressed, um, unexplored. So what, what do you actually do, which is a separate question from what parents can do, or you know, when you're just in conversation, how do you approach it? 
Well, I take a very pragmatic approach, which is that I want to change their minds and I need them to be able to listen to me and to hear me for that to happen. And so for me, and, and there are many different ways to do this, which I really respect, but what works for me is upending their expectations and um, surprising them, basically. So um, it's not uncommon for teachers to tell me in advance of, of my coming in to talk. Um, in one example, and this is a direct quote, that the, the male students had been heard talking in the corridors about how some feminist bitch was coming in to tell them how she hated men. Yeah. Um, and at that particular school, I walked out on the stage and there were 400 kids in the auditorium and every boy in there started wolf whistling at once in unison they would planned this in advance yeah and I think at that moment their expectation would have been that I would have I don't know what I would have panicked that, that there was this kind of automatic undermining and so I just I thanked them for providing the first example and then I said right. let's talk about it let's talk about what made you feel that you needed to do that let's talk about the fact that boys don't get wolf whistled at let's let's talk yeah. And I think a lot of what I do when I'm working in schools is directly addressing head on some of the uh, propaganda that I know that these boys specifically will be exposed to online. So we talk about some of the kind of hot button issues that men's rights activists hold up in online discussions in an attempt to kind of polarize and shut down feminism. So things like the male suicide rate, because online these kids will be hearing how can you bang on about feminism and claim that women are the victims of sexism when the male suicide rate is three times higher than it is for women? And the implication there, if you don't examine that, if you don't interrogate that, is this is about picking a team. It's men against women. Women's right. problems are made up. Men's problems are ignored. So we talk about the male suicide rate and we look at the statistics and I take, I walk them through it and we look at the fact that men don't receive support tragically when they experience mental health crises. Yeah. We look at the fact that by the age of university age, for example, fewer than a third of students accessing mental health services are male students. We talk about where that comes from, growing up in a world where we teach them boys don't cry, men are tough and manly and don't talk about their feelings. Then we talk about the fact that that's a gender stereotype and that no gender stereotype exists in a vacuum. Of course, they're two sides of the same coin. The other side of that particular coin being the idea that women are over emotional, hormonal, hysterical, can't contain their emotions. And suddenly you get to a point where you realize that these two things that we've been told are completely separate problems that's in opposition to each other are actually part of the same problem, that we are talking about something that affects all of us and we're fighting for a solution that will help all of us. Right, and I, I think, you know, I, I'd like us to just talk about what those hot buttons are because I think it's important for, um, frankly, adults to know what they are. So in my experience, they include the uh, denial of the wage gap, mm -hmm. two-siderism about abortion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a woman's ability and right to say that she doesn't want to be pregnant and, you know, sort of the denial of, of paternity. Um, those are some of the, the topics I see all the time, war and men being drafted into the war. The draft, yeah. Draft is another one. Um, you know, custody. custody. I mean, there are, as you say, these sort of hot button issues where people come to it particularly by saying they're playing devil's advocate. That's a you know, popular phrase where they want to debate you on these topics. Um, and so are there any, I don't want to say rhetorical, but you, know, you have this short moment of time yeah. when you're speaking to students, but if you are, for example, a teacher mm -hmm. and you encounter students who are using this language, acting in the ways you just described, frankly, really disrespectfully to women teachers. There are a lot of incidents of disrespect towards women teachers mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, is there anything, you know, is there anything that, that you would ideally see institutions do yeah. to respond more effectively? Absolutely. I mean, the first thing is for institutions to be able to recognize it. So mm -hmm. right now they don't have any kind of support, any kind of guidance on this. Schools have all kinds of duties and training and funding around recognizing and preventing other forms of extremism, identifying children who may be vulnerable to radicalization and preventing that. But right now there is almost no information whatsoever going into schools at a kind of from a kind of national framework. So that's the first thing. They can't do anything if they don't know it exists. Yeah, that's right. 
you know, training teachers properly and resourcing them properly to be supported to learn about this stuff and to recognize those red flags mm -hmm. for you or I a child talking about any one of those topics we've just reeled off would be an immediate red flag but for a teacher who didn't know about it whereas they may have been provided with information about red flags for other forms of extremism so first letting them know what those red flags are false rape allegations those kinds of things Second, I think it's about a whole school approach. So one particularly female teacher trying to tackle this stuff isn't gonna get anyway, anywhere because they've already been radicalized essentially. If you can get to them before the point of radicalization, we all know that actually de-radicalizing someone is incredibly complicated and labor intensive, preventing radicalization by giving young people resilience and kind of robust tools in terms of internet literacy, in terms of source checking, in terms of information from an early age about gender stereotypes, about the effect they have on us, age appropriate, simple, basic information about sexual consent and healthy relationships if we did that before the point that they encounter these ideas online then we would be essentially giving them a first line of defense a shot in the arm if you like but schools tend to tackle this stuff at 15 or 16 which is about seven years too late so i think starting early is the next thing i'd say making sure it's a whole school approach getting male teachers involved getting a senior leadership team involved so it's not just one female teacher who can be kind of brushed off by the kids as a kind of whinging feminazi actually male role models talking about this stuff is incredibly important and I think just recognizing how serious this stuff is because I think some schools and teachers might hear this kind of rhetoric and think it's a bit of a joke but the reality is that a men's rights activist in the United States um, just over a year ago had brought exactly one of these spurious lawsuits that we've been describing specifically about the draft and the idea that the draft is sexist, forcing men into war. And he um, felt um, disgruntled with the, with the judge, who was a woman of color, um, who this um, lawsuit had been brought up in front of and that she wasn't progressing it quickly enough. He described her as a feminazi. Yeah. And he dressed, disguised himself as a UPS driver and turned up at her house and opened fire when her husband and son opened the door, murdering her son and seriously injuring her husband. So I think just recognizing that when young people are exposed to this stuff online, it isn't, it isn't a joke. And it is part of a, of a really serious slipway to uh, radicalization. And specifically, it's seen as a gateway to white supremacy and neo-Nazism and the far right. It's not just that these things happen to overlap. Very explicitly, those groups see anti-feminism as a recruiting tool. They openly discuss the fact that they think it's easier, it's more realistic to grab a young person by anti-feminist rhetoric. They see it as a societally acceptable thing that it's easier to mask as jokes and banter and irony. And they see it as a gateway drug. And they actively describe the use of anti-feminist memes and cultural touch points and viral YouTube videos as adding cherry flavor to children's medicine. And they describe targeting getting boys as young as 11. So if schools are taking other forms of extremism seriously, they've got to recognize that this is a gateway as well as a form of extremism in its own right. Um, you know, it's interesting because we haven't really talked about things like political authoritarianism, but in the US, certainly with the rise of Trump, there was a lot of head scratching in the media about why it would be that immigrant men, uh, African-American men, uh, Hispanic men would join white supremacist groups, which was happening. And it seems quite evident, I think, if you're immersed in this, that um, there's a, so much rhetoric around what constitutes a real man that is based on this kind of misogyny that, as you say, you can recruit a diverse and broad spectrum of men into these communities um, before they get to the point where there's the racialized aspect of power and domination that's institutionalized in the sort of power, power system of the organizations. Um, I'm gonna just ask everyone right now to please add any questions that you may have in the chat. Um, I'm gonna turn to those in a few minutes. Um, I am gonna ask this question uh, about parents because in fact, family cultures really make a difference. And um, a lot of people are worried right now about, particularly with COVID, about kids uh, being online too much, gaming too much. Um, but there's a lot more at stake here than, you know, 
some of their concerns, which are legitimate in some ways, but the question of addiction or lack of attention or um, social skill degradation, which I would argue isn't really the case since boys actually use technology very effectively to build social networks, um, which is a whole other conversation. But can, can you talk about family environments? Because it's very often the case, in fact, that the sort of traditional benevolently sexist environment of, of, of culture gives some of the early expression of these concerns of pasts um, and the, the implicit uh, ambiguous sexism uh, inherent in, in that culture really enables some of this behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there is a huge amount of benevolent sexism that really kind of flies under the radar, even is very much encouraged within families. There are incredible statistics about the fact that the wage gap starts with pocket money, for example, that girls around the world, um, including in the US and the UK, are more likely to do uh, domestic chores and household labor than boys and um, likely to do significantly more of it. Um, we know that when there are girls in our family, it is incredibly normal for people to greet the girls and talk about how pretty they are, how beautiful they are, to see a boy they haven't seen for a while and talk about how they're growing up so strong. You know, we, we indoctrinate really children into these extremely gendered norms from within that sort of benevolent caring environment family environment and that normalizes and masks what becomes a form of extremism because it sort of almost lays the groundwork for it which isn't to blame families or parents because these are often very well-meaning things to do and say um, but it is to suggest that there are avenues for this to happen that we might not see it coming and particularly when we're talking about boys social media usage I think a lot of what we might see as, as normal and healthy um, online outlets are being ruthlessly um, used as forms of indoctrination and forms of um, arenas for radicalization by these groups in ways that parents might want to be aware of but might not be aware. So you've got um, YouTube, 85% of US teens say that they use YouTube, which is dramatically the, the most common social network. 51% uh, by comparison use Facebook, for example. And really significantly, because parents tend to view YouTube as the home of grumpy cat videos and, and movie trailers, right. is where teens get their news from. So they don't necessarily have unbiased sources. And we're talking about a network whose algorithm really has been hijacked by a far right racist, misogynistic influencer network. Yes. So I think it's about recognizing the power of some of those, what we think of as quite minor and benevolent influences on our children's lives. So the reality is that 37% of all mobile internet traffic internationally is accounted for by YouTube, which is just massive, one company. And then if you look at the fact that 70% of all the videos viewed on YouTube are videos queued up automatically by the algorithm, people are significantly watching more content on YouTube that YouTube picks for them than that they ever go looking for. Put those two statistics together, you have the fact that a quarter of all mobile traffic internationally around the world, a quarter of that is just people watching something that one company has picked to feed to them. And suddenly you think that is absolutely massive. We are talking about something massive. And then it becomes very significant if that particular network has really been gamed by this group. So if you start watching something and, and whistleblowers have said very clearly, the algorithm is not designed to suggest the highest quality content or the most relevant content, but the most extreme content, because that's what keeps people watching. And okay. YouTube's entire revenue stream is built on advertising so they just want your eyeballs on the screen for as long as possible okay. that is all that matters to them so suddenly something that parents might think of completely understandably as quite benign is actually something very weaponized and the same can be said for gaming for gaming chat rooms for gaming live streams when your teen has their headphones on and is gaming online connected with somebody that they've never met before but also for other spaces that we might think of as, as safe um, for young people online and bodybuilding forums are a very clever example of this. Yeah. When I started researching the book, I couldn't understand why so much of 
bodybuilding forums overlapped with incel forums and pickup artistry in terms of the content there until I realized what an incredibly clever recruiting tool yes. it was. If you are looking for a group of young people predisposed to be vulnerable to those specific ideas about hypermasculinity, about traditional forms of masculinity, of course, those who've self-selected into a forum about bulking up are, are very likely to be particularly susceptible. So it's clever and it's happening in places that we might not think of as dangerous. And it doesn't require a young person to be actively a member of an incel community or even to know what the word incel means, frankly, to come across and still to be radicalized by that content downstream on other social platforms. Right. So I'm going to jump over to our questions. Um, and I'm going to be uh, I, I'm more rigorous with our time um, because there's there's several good questions. So maybe if we can, let's see, uh, what, I'm just trying to keep track here. One, two, four, five. Okay, well, what I may do if, if I wave my hand is just the sign to you that we should move to the next one. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so a couple of questions are, are sort of, the theme around them is really what professionals, what institutions can do. There are three questions. You might want to go through them one okay. at a time, because I think some are related in a sort of uh, over, overarching way. But the first one is, what do you think journalists should know or keep in mind in order to better report on white male supremacist violence against women? Yeah. Okay. So I think what I would say is, as a kind of almost a cheat sheet, try to Think about your reporting um, through the lens of if you are reporting on another form of extremism, because if you look at the coverage, for example, of um, uh, radical Islamist terrorism, it receives about four times as much coverage as other forms of terrorism, and it tends to be framed completely differently. So if you are devoting column inches, as very often happens in these cases, to coverage from former teachers about what a sweet, innocent boy he was, or neighbors about how he helped them cut their grass, think a little bit about whether you would provide that form of excuses and talking about lone wolves and mental health problems to another form of terrorism. And think about the international definition of terrorism very simply and whether this meets that standard, which I think it does. Right, and I would say too that so much of the coverage um, really focuses on individuals and not context but the type of context that you write about in your book, giving people a little bit of background regarding what even the definition of terrorism looks like. I think a lot of people don't really think about it. Um, all right, the next question is, what role should the gaming industry play in combating the use of their forums? And I, and I know they try um, in some ways, but in combating the use of their forums to promote misogyny, uh, I would add other forms of hatred, and are they doing anything? Well, I think you only have to look at Gamergate to recognize the very deep running problems within the gaming industry with misogyny and with racism. Um, I think that it is um, an area to be unequivocal because Gamergate was um, a campaign where there was enormous obfuscation of what was really going on, of targeted harassment and, and hate. Um, under this kind of veil of integrity and, and promoting and, and trying to keep the industry pure and defending values. So I think that being realistic about what is happening is important, but I also think this is a difficult question because when we talk about gaming specifically being used as a recruiting tool, we are often talking actually about kind of discord servers and we're talking about chat rooms which are used to discuss gaming strategy but are not necessarily directly owned by gaming companies. So I think really what we're talking about there has enormous overlap with holding social media platforms to account, which as you and I both know through our very long history of working together to try and tackle online abuse um, is something that we've still really failed to do in any meaningful way. And I think that really that perhaps is of a greater urgency than specifically looking at gaming and its role in this. Yeah, I, I agree because I think that no matter what the platform of choice may be, what you're really seeing is this efflorescence of social norms that are tolerated or cultivated um, and running rampant in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so it's a very complicated, very complicated issue. Um, this is a question related. Um, do you think that the porn industry also enforces, reinforces the anti-feminist views within society? And um, I would just add to that 
to ask for your comment as well. When, when you're describing YouTube and the increasing kind of extremism that is necessary to keep people engaged, right, down the rabbit hole of more and more kind of cognitively yeah. um, extreme and engaging information, that algorithmic process is the logic of pornography over the last 20, 20 years, right? Um, so can you maybe comment on the misogyny of mainstream porn, but also that logic of how yeah. the porn industry shaped the internet? Absolutely. I mean, we know that the porn industry accounts for a, a shocking amount of internet real estate. I think it's 70%. It's absolutely massive. It may even be more than that. Um, um, so in terms of the normalization of misogyny and online pornography and, and the increasing extremism of online pornography, I think what we're really talking about here is, is a culture gap, which is relevant to this whole conversation. We have have a unique moment in history right now which has never happened before and will never happen again and yet which we rarely discuss even though it has enormous implications which is a moment where a generation of non-digital natives are parenting and educating a generation of digital natives that will never happen again and i think the culture gap there is as enormous as a group of people from one country trying to parent and educate a group of people living in another country but it's just not acknowledged in the same way. What that means specifically in relation to online porn is that you are talking about something about a landscape inhabited by young people. 60% of young people are 14 when they first see it, a quarter have seen it by the age of 12. So most young people, and yet it's a landscape of which many adults remain unaware parents. So when I talk to parents about porn, they assume I'm talking about an online version of a, an FHM centerfold, yeah. a, a Playboy fold. Playboy you know, you're looking at a woman in a bikini or a topless woman or a static on a screen. And I think it's really important to recognize what we're talking about now with the most mainstream, easily accessible pornography, the kind of thing you would find if you were a curious, embarrassed 13 year old who typed the word sex into Google and clicked on the first link is videos that are extremely racist, misogynistic, that um, put women, present women as completely dehumanized tropes, that present sex as something violent that is done to women by men for male pleasure explicitly, and that involves degradation, humiliation, pain, violence against women, to the extent that Durham University recently did a very robust study and they found that one eighth of all of the videos on mainstream porn websites were showing acts which were illegal, in other words, coercion, violence, rape. So you have this situation situation where I'm going into schools and it is incredibly common to meet young people who talk about sex which they've seen online they don't use the word porn and they say things like I'm so scared because now I've seen this video I know that when you have sex the woman has to be hurting and crying or they say things like it's not rape it's a compliment really right. they say things like um it's not rape if you shout surprise um I was in a school where they'd had a rape case involving a 14 year old boy and a teacher had said to him why didn't you stop when she was crying and he had said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex, crying's part of foreplay. So the, the disconnect between young people's ideas about what a relationship looks like and what sex is and reality is, is becoming wider and wider, driven, I think, very much by that very extreme nature of online porn, which is quite ubiquitous. And of course, that links in with all the rest of what we're talking I, about here. You know, it's interesting, too, the study you referenced with Durham, there's a similar a uh, series of studies here that show that over the last few decades, um, accept, social acceptance of porn has gone up uh, uh, between men and women, but the gap between men and women is growing very quickly so that men are more and more accepting and women are less and less expecting, accepting. And so while the, you know, if you just looked at the overall number, it would look like, oh yes, societal tolerance has gone up, the United States is less puritanical, blah, 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 blah. But in fact, this division, I think, is reflective of the norms that you see in that type of porn. I mean, there, you know, we could have a, a whole week of talking about just porn and, and it's <laughs> the ethical porn, feminist porn. Um, but I think it's undeniable that mainstream porn is misogynistic the way other mainstream mainstream culture and artifacts are. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to keep going here. Um, I will say there are two comments here. One has to do with the draft and one has to do with dating. And one has to do with misogyny in the Arab world. And I mentioned those three together 
um, because I'm going to ask you to respond to them together. You may not want to, but in my experience, those three topics fall often into the category of red flags for me. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one really is about the draft, um, which you discussed, which we discussed. Um, I don't think any feminists I know have actively sought out the male only draft as far as I can tell. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to comment on that one first. And then um, the second one is how can we talk about misogyny without talking about misogyny in Islam? And then the third one is about women being massively privileged in the dating world. Um, and uh, while many women say they're held to unattainable standards and people react with empathy, men have the stronger argument that dating is more difficult and that incels feel like they're held to unattainable standards. Okay. Well, I think what I would say about each of these arguments is that they are all topics, is that they are outlying topics within a bigger picture that focusing on any one of these topics on its own, although we will, and I'm quite happy to do that and they will have answers. Um, is often a, an intentional um, undermining or refusal to look at the kind of bigger picture. So right. that is the first thing I want to say. Yes, there are specific issues. There are specific areas where men are specifically affected by particular things. Even in those cases, that doesn't negate the reality of the enormously gendered nature of the problem, that we do live in a world where there is an epidemic of male sexual violence, that male victims of sexual violence are themselves victims of male sexual violence, that we live in a world where institutionalized and endemic um, gender inequality disproportionately impacts women and girls on a daily basis, politically, culturally, socially, economically. Um, within that framework, if you look at any one of these specific issues that directly affect men, and let's take the draft and let's look at that, then you can see how it has its roots in that deeply gendered, hierarchical, patriarchal society and norms that disproportionately harm women and girls. So the draft, generally speaking, we're talking about something that doesn't have um, an impact in the same way now on men's lives as it did in the past. Um, it was a, a deeply sexist idea based on the notion that men are angry, physical, masculine, strong, that they're able to fight, that the women's job is to stay at home and look after the children. Again, what I'd say, just like when we're talking about mental health and the male suicide rate, is that this is a gender stereotype. It is a really good example of the way in which gender stereotypes have negatively impacted men through history. And of course, the flip side has enormous and massive impact on women. The idea that women aren't strong, the idea that women aren't tough, the idea that women aren't able to um, fight, the idea that women don't belong in, um, not only in the arena of war, but that they don't belong in the workplace at all, that they belong at home, keeping the home fires burning. What I would say is that that is something that is a stereotype that continues to affect the lives of millions of women today on a day-to-day -day basis. Women who don't get jobs because they're women. Women, the 54,000 women a year in the UK who lose their jobs because they get pregnant because of maternity discrimination. The women who aren't considered suitable for a promotion. The women who, as one Nobel scientist recently said, shouldn't have jobs in a science lab because they'll either cry or fall in love with you. So if you look at that gender stereotype as a whole, taking into account both sides of it, I think many more women at the moment are disproportionately affected by it than men are. But yes, it's a good example of how sexism through history has affected people of all genders, often at the same time. Yeah. Um, the question specifically, I think, about um, particular religions and the treatment of women within those religions, nobody is suggesting for a second that that isn't a problem, mm -hmm. that many global religions don't have an enormous and uh, gendered impact, that they don't have extremely misogynistic building blocks and practices. Um, but it is, I think, disingenuous to suggest that it is only one religion that has that particular issue. Many of the schools that I go into where girls have been taught that it is their duty and responsibility to avoid sexual violence, that if they're raped, it is their own fault because they wore a short skirt, are, for example, Catholic schools. Okay. Um, within, I think, pretty much every religion, yes, there are enormous problems with misogyny, but is misogyny confined to those religions? No, because within sec secular society, we're seeing all of the same problems. So I think it is a, it is right to tackle the issues within those religions and there are women within each of those religions doing that whose lead we can follow but it is I think a mistake to think that that those problems aren't much broader in terms of their impact in our society.
and, and I think the idea there is to that somehow we're supposed to be quiet about the misogyny that we each in our various contexts face um, as though there's a hierarchy of the oppression and we should uh, focus it, uh, on it in that way. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left and there are two questions that I would like to come to, which are actually, I think ultimately related. One is how can we address this problem when educating young women and girls? Is this, the manosphere, something that young women and girls should be made aware of growing up? which I think is a very complicated question. Yeah. Um, the second question is, I'm a 40 something uh, woman politician in Canada, I've been subjected to ongoing targeted harassment um, that's now resulted in the men who harassed me filing an integrity commissioner complaint against me in an effort to use the system to continue the harassment. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for trying to get my 50 to 80 year old rich white male colleagues to understand that this is in fact about misogyny and not about the fact that I'm quote unquote controversial. Um, and the reason I think those are related, <laughs> well, you should, you should talk about that. Why don't you address them separately? And then if you feel that they are also related, just mm -hmm. you'll, you'll connect those. I think what I would say first of all is that I'm so sorry that you've had that experience. Um, I, perhaps this is or isn't a comfort, but you are very much not alone. The vast majority of the female politicians I speak to experience this kind of harassment, both from their own colleagues and from the general public. Um, unfortunately, although this may not be particularly comforting, um, when I was researching the book, two of the most extreme members, I would say, of the communities that I uncovered, men who run websites devoted to articles about rape, about paedophilia, um, about ways to um, render women unconscious in order to rape them. One of them was a congressional candidate and one of them was a state representative. So in the, the idea I, in the US. Both, just to make that clear. Yeah, so the idea that we can expect male politicians to be immune to or to be able to rise above these particular forms of extremism, unfortunately, is not always realistic. Um, and I think we should recognize that that may be what you're up against. Um, I think, for me, the most pragmatic advice in terms of women encountering this in any kind of workplace is standing together closing ranks, getting other women and male colleagues, if possible, to support you. It is much easier to scapegoat one woman as a feminazi or somebody controversial than it is to tackle a group of women standing together saying this is unacceptable and we will not stand for this. So I think my best advice would be to get female colleagues on board if you're able to stand together as a group to try and tackle it. Um, and I think when we talk about educating young women and girls, and for me, the connection here is that really you shouldn't be asking the question and the answer shouldn't be addressed to you. It should be people in positions of institutional power tackling this stuff. We shouldn't be having to give advice to incredible trailblazing women who are working in politics on how to avoid this kind of extreme harassment. And we shouldn't be having to educate girls about how to avoid or be aware of the manosphere because we should be tackling their male peers. The answer to this question is that in my experience young women and girls are already very aware of this they are aware of the content their male peers are consuming they're aware of the extreme nature of it and that's why as Soraya has, has described they shut down in these conversations they don't want to admit to being feminist in a school discussion because they know about the bombardment of abuse that they'll face subsequently as a result the answer for me is that we shouldn't be any longer educating young women and girls how to jump higher and higher and higher over hurdles. We should be removing the hurdles from their way. For decades, we've taught girls not to go out in short skirts, not to drink the wrong thing, not to take the wrong kind of cab, not to take the wrong kind of route, to go to the bathroom in groups and hold their keys between their fingers and text each other when they get home. And it has done nothing to reduce sexual violence because there is no magic trick to protect yourself. The only thing that we can do as a society that would be efficient that would have an impact is to tackle the perpetrators and to prevent the problem in the first place. So for me, in both cases, we are talking about the problem from the wrong end. We are talking about trying to teach women and girls how to handle this stuff instead of imagining, dreaming, daring to suggest that we could stop it from happening in the first place. And we have to shift to that perspective. Well, that's, that's a good um, segue to this very last question, um, which I'll but I'll start off by actually saying that so much of what we just talked about was captured um, in a TikTok that was viral this week in the US, certainly. It was just a, a young woman in a college class, a class, the only woman in the class was a computer science class. And 
she just had her phone on record while all of her classmates talked about um, how to quote unquote have sex with women who couldn't consent. Um, and it was a joke and there, everyone was, all the boys in her class, all the men in her class they were men, they were in college, were involved. This question is how can more men be recruited to this cause of defeating misogyny? Mm -hmm. And you know, you're talking about shifting the focus to institutions and context and boys and men. Um, so can you, can you maybe close with that? Because I think it's really the most important point that we can make here. I think perhaps three answers. The first is start young. It is too late once they've been radicalized, but we can get them all if we do it at a young age, if we do it in schools. The second answer is um, holding social media companies accountable, because if we cut down on the readiness with which this bile is spewed at them, then we'll have a better chance of more of them escaping it. And the third and most important answer, I think, is other men. This is where men come in. Men are asking a lot at the moment and, and brilliantly so, how can I be an ally? How can I get involved? What's my place in this movement? And the answer is not to try and find your place in the feminist movement. The answer is to take the spaces that are already yours, those masculine spaces in the world and make them more feminist. This is what men can do. Talk to other men, recruit other men, describe these things to other men, have difficult conversations with other men that might be very difficult for women to have and get as many of them on board as you can. And, and I would say, you know, it's very hard for men to stand in those spaces and not laugh at the jokes, right? Because the penalties are very high. Um, but there are also some super interesting studies that show that even in those context locker rooms, quiet dinners, sports events, many more men want to say something and don't um, than people realize. And so being able to shift those cultures and make those connections with like-minded men, I think is very important for boys. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be polished and perfect, I would say, just jump in. The, my favorite male response ever is a guy who said that reading the Everyday Sexism Project entries has made him realize how harassment impacts women and girls' lives every day. He'd never thought about it before. And the next day he was in the street and he saw two men shouting at a woman in front of him from a building site, shouting, get your breasts out. And he panicked and he was like, this is my moment. I have to do something. I can't think what to say. So he lifted up his t-shirt and showed them his instead. Uh <laughs> and it was simple but effective. It said, you wouldn't do this to me, so why are you doing it to them? <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm going to hand this back over to Morgan. It was delightful to talk to you, as thank always. You. And thank you for this book, which I really urge everyone to read um, and have these very difficult conversations. Yes, at the dinner table, um, which is really important to do. So thank you. Yes, that was a great question to end on. And on the behalf of Politics and Prose, I'd like to thank you, Laura and Soraya, for being with us, with us um, this evening. Um, thank you for this great conversation. Uh, we would also like to remind you to buy Men Who Hate Women from Politics and Prose. The link is in the chat at the moment and your purchase of, book, of books from us are the reason we're able to put on these events for you all. And we also like to just thank our audience for always tuning in and supporting the bookstore. And we wish everyone have a great evening. Take care.